Dangers of False Worship Music in the Church What Jesus Teaches About the Danger of False Worship If you have been paying attention, you must be concerned about the rise in false and misleading worship music in our churches. Compared to most traditional worship songs and hymns, many popular contemporary worship music are not as rich in theological depth and substance. The lyrics of some of these songs lack the doctrinal clarity and are clearly not written to glorify God and God alone. Perhaps you too have noticed how many of the so-called modern worship services prioritize entertainment over genuine worship. The use of professional bands, elaborate light shows, and theatrical production elements are great, but sometimes these prompts are taken to a point where they distract from the focus on God. With that said, in this episode, we are going to discuss worship music and dig deep into what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. We are going to use the encounter and the conversation between Jesus and the woman at a well in Samaria as the basis for this discussion. In the book of John chapter 4, the Bible tells us that Jesus traveled from Judea to Galilee, using a route that Jews would normally avoid for fear of being attacked by Samaritans. Perhaps I should speak a bit about the historical tension between the Jews and the Samaritans of the time to provide some context. If you recall, the Babylonians exiled the Israelites between 597 to 586 BCE after King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon conquered Jerusalem. The Babylonians captured King Jehoiakim and deported a significant number of the Israelite elite, including scholars, craftsmen, and the royal family to Babylon. During their time in Babylon, the Israelites continued to maintain their faith and traditions, including avoiding marriage to non-Jews. However, not every Jew was captured and sent to exile. Some remained at home. But those left at home were not enough in number and in strength to preserve the Jewish territory. So, many foreigners came to Jerusalem and occupied the city. Soon, the home-based Jews, as I would call them here, started fraternizing with these foreigners. They started marrying their women, as well as giving off their own daughters in marriage to them. While those under the yoke of slavery in Babylonian exile maintained their traditions and cultures, those at home did not, at least with respect to marriage. The exile experience of the Israel nation eventually came to an end when the Persians, under the leadership of Cyrus the Great, conquered Babylon in 539 BCE. Cyrus issued a decree allowing the Israelites to return to their homeland and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. However, when they returned home, they found that things have changed significantly. Their folks have intermarried and intermixed with foreigners, producing mixed-race children. The returning Israelites, who saw themselves as pure Jews, were upset about this development. They resolved to shun those whose Jewish blood have been mixed with foreigners. They call them the Samaritans. The Samaritans were pushed to the outskirt of Jerusalem. They grew as a nation and became hostile to Israelites. They would attack any Israelites that travel through their land. That was why it was surprising that Jesus traveled through Samaria. Now that you have the backstory, let's look at the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman and how that led to Jesus teaching us how to properly worship God. The encounter and conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, as described in John chapter 4, is important and deeply symbolic. It happened at a well in Samaria near a town called Sychar at around noon. Jesus and his disciples were traveling through the region of Samaria, which was inhabited by Samaritans. Jesus, exhausted from his journey, sits by the well while his disciples went into town to buy food. A Samaritan woman comes to the well to draw water, and Jesus asks her for a drink of water, initiating the conversation. This request is unusual because, as we have shown before, Jews and Samaritans generally did not interact, and Jewish men did not speak to Samaritan women. The Samaritan woman is surprised by Jesus' request, and asks him why a Jewish man would ask a Samaritan woman for water, given the historical tensions between their people. Jesus was cryptic in his response. He tells her that if she knew who was asking her for a drink, she would have been the one asking him for living water. The woman is puzzled by the concept of living water, 
she said to Jesus, Sir, you haven't got a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get the living water? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Further in the conversation, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. In verse 21, Jesus said to the woman, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So, this leads us into three key lessons that we can learn about worship. The first lesson is that worship is not about a place, it's about God. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Jesus is making the point that worship is not about where you are, but who you are worshiping. He says it's not about which mountain you worship. True worship and fellowship require the knowledge of God. This because the more you know about God's character, the more you know about Him, the more and deeper you'll be able to give yourself up to worship Him. Notice the other thing Jesus says. He says the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. It is impossible for us to worship God when the music we are using to worship Him and listening to is untrue. If the music is untrue, it means we're singing lies to God. We're singing lies about God to God. God clearly cannot accept such worship. I could list several popular lyrics, but I am not going to. There is no need. Because I know that when you hear worship song that misses the theological point, you will know. There is no need for a public condemnation of any artist. Watch out for lyrics that stretch the truth and exaggerate human importance over God. Make sure the songs you use for worship are rooted in theological truth and glorifies no other than God. Here is the other lesson that we must learn about worship. Worship must be God-centered. Jesus says the Father is looking those who will worship Him in truth and in spirit. So, let your worship song be God-centered instead of human-centered. If a song focuses too much on the attribute of singer instead of the character of God, that is a red flag. The third and final lesson to learn about worship is that worship needs to be spirit-led. Jesus did not only say that we must worship in truth, but also that true worship happens in spirit and in truth. The spirit component is just as important. We do not just go through the motions of singing from our head. It has to come from the heart and deep within our soul. It must be meaningful and substantive. True worship is when our mind and our spirit is engaged because worshiping God should take the whole of our being. When our spirit is engaged, that's when it becomes spirit-filled and partake in a spirit-led worship. To round up this episode, I want to encourage you to pay attention to the music you use for worship. Let it be God-focused rather than self-adulation. Let it be spirit-led rather than you going through the motion of singing and dancing. Be the one whose worship the Father is looking for. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Amen.